What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 99 of the Rudest Wrestling Podcast, brought to you always by us. Matt, I'm excited today because um, yesterday you told me you had a question, and I, I'm very curious to hear what it is uh, and debate this topic. And so I, I think, you know, when I was reflecting a little bit more, it's not necessarily a question. It's more an, an extension of the conversation that we started yesterday based on your Metal Mondays on you know, basically sports specialization. When do you really push? You know, we're talking about the the ten year old state champion, you know, and where where he goes, how he's been directed, how he's been pushed, right? And it Yeah, of course. It triggered a conversation that my wife and I were having about um a podcast that Malcolm Gladwell ha- had with David Epstein. You know, I, I know that you're very familiar with, with yes. David Epstein. He's one. Of, He's awesome. Yeah. And, but, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to listen to that because I, from what I remember, Epstein kind of debunks uh, in a couple of his books. He debunks Malcolm Gladwell or argues with um, the points that Malcolm Gladwell makes in his book. So uh, is the podcast like antagonistic or are they really, um, do they like each other? What's the relationship? There? No, they, they, they seem to like each other each other they just in certain okay. areas as much as they agreed on certain things there were certain areas where they kind of diverged diverged uh, yeah big and, time so know, um so if you have it if you have if you're not familiar with him gladwell's much more mainstream david epstein uh wrote this rain it's called range and he wrote the sports gene which are both really fantastic books i would highly recommend them um for those of you guys who don't know who that is or what he does and what what they were kind of discussing they kind of targeted and honed in on tiger woods and Reg, roger federer who are generally considered yep the best to have ever done what they did in golfing and in tennis. um, I believe. But but their approach to their specialization in their sport was dramatically different. I think when you look at Tiger Woods, I don't think there's been a more specialized athlete in in (laughs) arguably the most specialized athlete ever. Right from the time he was two, three, four years old, yeah. he was yes. yep. he was all into golfing, and his life revolved around golfing and his training and, yes. and everything, everything, literally everything. everything in his life was consumed by being the greatest golfer ever. And he's you know yes. he's done that. You know, I, I'm sure you can argument. You, you, there's some. I, I think he's the greatest golfer ever. If not, if not his top couple. So right. wh- whatever, right? Yeah. Well. And then you you look at Roger Federer, and he was his parents actually withheld the sport of tennis for as long as they could. He kept saying, but his mom was but his mom was a tennis coach, correct? Isn't that the story? Correct. Yes, but okay. So he kept wanting to coach. do tennis, and she's like, "No, I want you to do soccer. I want you to do this activity. I want to do that." And so she he kept wanting to jump into the sport, and she kept. De- not denying his interest, yep. but tempering yep. the interest. Um, Temp- tempering is a good word for that. And, you nailed it. And then once he fully came engaged, I mean, look where he's at now. That's what's kind of amazing with both of these guys. Roger Federer is just getting ready to turn 38. He's still, he's on the verge. He could potentially end this year ranked number one in the world at th- 38, which is absurd in the sport of tennis. You know, nobody has really competed yes. at a high level or really won at one um, a grand slam at, at his age or been this consistently competitive at, at this age. And then you look at Ty, Tiger Woods, who's now 43. He's still, he won yeah. a, another green jacket last year on the heels of, you know, his well-documented, you know, injuries and other personal issues. But it's, it's amazing to me that both of these guys who specialize in their, the, the most dominant individuals well no, they, one, one one specialized and one did, did not. not i mean yes. I, I don't think i don't think oh uh, well i mean okay let's not say did not because i think i believe if i remember right uh federer was kind of allowed to choose tennis full-time at maybe at maybe six age 16 is that right correct yep i think so i mean so that's not like forever right that's i mean you're still kind of a kid and i guess where i would see you know where i would correlate this to wrestling matt i mean i, I would say the, the only obvious here is that there's not one way to do it there's multiple ways to get people really great where i would see this correlating really strongly to wrestling um is that i see a lot of a lot of my in my era and older who they had a kind of a crap experience in wrestling, right? There's still there's still some affection or love for it, but they got grinded out. They were made cut a lot of weight, and they don't like it. And they are going to hold their kids back from doing it, okay? 
And so in one instance, that's totally fair. But when you're a high level wrestler or you're a wrestling coach, you can put your kid on the fast track, right? So you can hold them back till not let them compete till they're 11, 12, 13, 14. And then because you have the knowledge and the access to other stuff, you can make them really, really good, really, really fast. And so, you know, that's kind of where, uh, where I think I messed, I'll say I messed up when we started AWA because we pushed back too hard against that, right? We said, don't compete till you're older, blah, 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 blah. And we had people, uh, you know, not everybody, but some people listened too well to us. And then what I realized is if, if for, for most people, right, who don't have access to that parent in the household coaching or their dad who was like an NCAA All-American or something, if they don't have access to that, it does take them a little longer. And so, you know, if they're not competing much till their eighth grade, they're going to be at a significant disadvantage in ninth grade, 10th grade. Now, if they're really, really into it, they could absolutely make it up. Absolutely. Um, but for most kids, you know, I would say, say sixth, seventh, eighth grade is where they need to start really getting more competition, taking it more seriously um, if they want to achieve. Because the, the other thing, and this is like my, my other coach at my academy, Coach Messenbrink, he rages against this. But the other thing that's so important to note now, and, and I think everyone everyone will acknowledge this is a huge, gigantic negative, but no one no one is stopping it and no one is changing it, is that kids are recruited as sophomores. They are, period. And there's a lot of kids who develop their sophomore, junior, and they're not, they're not their best till their senior year, but kids are getting recruited as sophomores. So if you want to get those high-level scholarships from the best programs, you have to be really, really, really good as a freshman and sophomore. And I think that's a huge negative, but I don't see myself being able to change the system, so I have to acknowledge the system is the way it is. Well, then, you know, if your college scholarship, scholarship basically or your – your future opportunities that are coming at a younger and younger age, freshman and sophomore year, then almost you almost have to bump up, you know, how much you focus and, yeah. and push your, your athlete. Now, all of a sudden, like if you're that guy, like, and, and it stinks, we don't want to, but you, it stinks because you kind of have to You have to, you don't have a choice. And it's, it's kind of, I was actually having a conversation with one of my former athletes. He was talking to me about his, his brother and he's like, Hey, what's your thoughts you know, on cutting weight in high school. And I said, well, it's a lot the same as what it is in in college, but which I don't believe you should do it. I think it ruins a lot of kids. I think it takes away from from your development and your growth and progression when you start overemphasizing what weight class should you be as opposed to developing your skill. Absolutely. Um, and I, I said, well, you got to also think in the long term, what does your brother want to do? And I know that he wants to compete at a very high level in college. So I think you've got to keep that long-term vision in mind as you're making those short-term decisions about the immediate wrestling season. Like if I cut a ton of weight now as a freshman or sophomore, and that starts affecting my passion and my development yeah, in the sport. huge. You're not even you're not going to be fully engaged to that next step that you say you want to get to, right? You say you want to wrestle at a high level D1 institution. You know, I'm trying yep. to, you know, when he was posing this question to me, I'm like, okay, this is for me, this is an eight year question as opposed to a one year question. You know, what you're wanting in this one year sure. is much different than what you're saying you want in the next eight years. So the answer I'm giving to you yeah. is probably the best answer for eight years from now, but I get where you're coming from. It's like, well, it's a chicken or the egg, right? I want to wrestle at a very high level Absolutely. D1 institution to do that. I've got and we can, we can acknowledge Matt that probably wrestling at, you know, you could pick a few places are, is, is a significant advantage to being good at wrestling. I mean, are there kids who uh, succeed at low level programs? Absolutely. I went to Mizzou and never had a national champion, you know, national champion. And I was able to succeed, but uh, you know, lo and behold, I think you would say for sure that going to a handful of the top programs is a huge benefit, huge advantage towards you being good long term. Right. And so I, I so I guess with with my my former athlete when I, when I was talking to him, I was like, well, it's a little trickier than that because to get to that big time program, you've got to make sacrifices at a younger age that might not be in general beneficial it's long term. Tough. It's tough. Yes. For yes. You to, to be recognized by the these elite D1 institutions, you've got to distinguish yourself in a certain way. You can't really sit down with John Smith and say, hey, 
My <laughs> my best is going to be when I'm a, a junior and senior in college. I know you're not seeing that now, but just take my word for it. You know, I'm not this finished product that you want to see now, and I don't necessarily have yeah. this national title or this state championship that you would like to see in on my resume to offer me a certain scholarship. So it's yeah, it's like a, and, and it's a the, vicious. And that, Matt, Matt, here's the thing about it. Like, and listen, I, this I'm going to tell you this point blank. This is this is crazy to me, but. I've had a few kids where I'm like, hey, you know, the other thing is has been wrestling is physical maturity, right? That that has a huge benefactor to if you physically mature earlier, it's going to be hugely beneficial. But I've had kids, Matt, who I'm like, I know, and I won't, I'm not going to say names, but I know this is going to be good. He's, he's not good. By all. I'll give you one. Peyton Mako was went to it, a high school state tournament as a sophomore. But, you know, he just started taking wrestling more seriously. I, I could see how good he was going to be. And... I would tell college coaches, this kid is going to be really good. I promise you. And Matt, no one would take my word for it. If they don't take my word for it, man, they ain't taking anyone's word for it. They got to see the results. And that, that's the tough thing about it is, and then so eventually, you know, Peyton doesn't place it like three national tournaments in a row. And then eventually he had that really good flow nationals and he almost beat Sammy Sasso. And then, you know, after that, everyone started recruiting him. Right. But, but before that, when I was telling people, listen, I'm telling you guys right now, this kid is going to be good. They, they did not take my word for it. They wouldn't do it. And then, you know, obviously once he became good, they all recruited him. And so, yeah, to your point, it's like the kids actually have to go do it. Um, and, and the college coach is not just going to take anyone's word for it that, oh, this guy's going to be good. Yeah, I'm hoping maybe long term, once we produce enough of those type of kids that maybe the college coaches will, in fact, take my word for it. But uh, for the time being, they do not. Yeah, And I think, you know, and, I, and, and I'm speaking from a form, from a former college coach's perspective, like when I look at AWA, now I'm starting to see like year in and year out, you're consistently producing high level guys. So now you're, you're growing the credibility of yourself as a coach, right? Yeah. In your academy where as in mm -hmm. maybe four years ago or three years ago, people were like, yeah, Ben, I know who you are and I know the athlete you, yeah, you, you were, but I don't necessarily know what you're producing as a coach. Yep, and absolutely. once you like Peyton, and all these guys right now, like they're the trailblazers to earning the credibility for future generations of AWA guys that yeah. in the future, you can say maybe in two or three years, like, Hey, Pate mock, Hey coach, this guy's going to be good. And I'm like, yes, yep. I've seen, I've seen what you produced. <laughs> I've seen, yep. you know, all the kids at, you know, all the institutions that, that they're wrestling at now. So you've got that credibility right now. It's like AWA is still, earning that credibility in but, the minds of college coaches. But so, so for, for parents and other coaches out there, it, it is tough because they're not going to take your word for it. Right. They aren't. They need to see the results, which is tough. And so then the other thing I want to add on to this, um, it kind of, and I mentioned the self-fulfilling prophecy yesterday, but the other thing that I think that is tough is, is self-fulfilling prophecy and access. So one of the huge things that we, you know, we've acknowledged that it's helping the United States right now, but it's also essentially making the rich get richer or helping the, the rich kids get richer is, um, you know, when I, I told you I made the junior world team in 2004, we didn't go to the world. We didn't go to a camp. We didn't do anything. It was like, okay, here's your medal, Ben. <laughs> you know, go go on your way. And now with uh, they have now they even have a 15 U world team. They have a 17 U, which is cadet world team. They have a junior world team. And so what's happening is all of these kids who are who are already the best, right? They won the tournament, so they're the best right then and there. They're then getting to go and be around the best guys in the next age group, the best guys at the senior level, the best coaches, and they're getting access to all these opportunities, which then, you know, and it's not perfect, but for a lot of them, it makes them even better than they already are uh, at an early age. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. If everyone had that same access, um, I think you would even see more changing as they get older, but not everyone does. Right. So, yeah, no, it's, it's an awesome discussion. I, th I, think, I think it could... Um, I think it could take the whole podcast up. Yeah, and, and listen, the the range and sports team by David Epstein, those are amazing books. You should read those. Gladwells are good, but they're kind of surface level in my opinion. Uh hope I hope I don't sound too stuck up when I say that. <laughs> no, I mean but, <laughs> but the, uh, the levels that you're looking for, like I I do appreciate you know, a lot of the stuff that Malcolm Glad Gladwell writes and he comes from so yeah. many diverse areas. That's what I appreciate about him. Like he's, you know, where David Epstein, he's more in line, just more sports centric um, in a lot of ways. Yes. And so it's, it's probably yep. more specialized, right? 
you know, talk about specialization. Yeah. Gladwell is more diverse in, you know, his approach and some of his his books and his research where, you know, David Epstein is more sports centric, which I think is fascinating as well. Yeah. Um Okay, let's get into wrestling. Uh, one one thing we skipped yesterday, we didn't skip it yesterday, we didn't have that much time. Um, well, and I don't really want to talk about it, but my, my Mizzou Tigers, they kind, <laughs> kind of got the butts kicked um, and uh, by Virginia Tech. And, and Virginia Tech's got a really good team. You know, Mizzou, did, they didn't wrestle at 33, and then Grant Lee did not wrestle at 41. I, I, I don't know why. Um, I don't have the inside scoop on that. So obviously that hurt, but uh, a lot of really, really good individual matchups in this duel. I think Virginia Tech's going to be good this year. I mean, I, ra- I, don't, man, I saw that they're ranked all the way down at uh, 18, and I don't really know why. I mean, I, I have to really study, but when I look at Virginia Tech's team, um, it feels like, hey, they're better than that. You know, they're not, um, they're not all the way down. This ranking that I'm looking at right now has them at 16. So maybe it was they have, more, they have a really good team. More so the the Mekhi Lewis effect, even though maybe maybe yeah. on the surface people are looking like, man, you're you're taking a national champ out of your lineup. That's that's a huge. That's twenty five points. And yeah, but then you you slide McFadden and he looked. You know, for we'll see how McFadden. it plays out. He beat he beat up he beat up my guy. Yeah, <laughs> Damn it, Pate Maka, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, the the question was, well, well, what would McFadden look like? And it doesn't seem like it's going to be a big drop off from from what they had with Mekhi Lewis. And he McFadden was an All American at yeah. sixty five, right, two years ago. Um, so yeah. we kind of know what he's going to do. And it it seems like this is probably his more natural weight class. Um, I, I think I think it's more natural weight class. Um, you know, the, the top three at this weight class are really good in uh, Marinelli, Chenzo, and Evan Wick. But, you know, when you go, I, I think, um, I feel, and I could be wrong, I almost feel like four is kind of a low end for, um, like, I I, th- I don't really see anyone below uh, David McFadden being able to come up and beat him. And I think he, he, he I'm not saying he's beating uh, any of those other guys I mentioned, but I think, uh, I think they're going to be really competitive matches. Yeah, I think, I don't think it's going to be a surprise throughout the season if, if McFadden knocks off one of these guys. It's not going to be like, whoa. Yeah. Holy cow, we didn't see that coming. Yes. I wouldn't say he's going to be favored in a lot of those matches, but if he knocks off those guys or if he actually makes a run to the national finals, I'm not going to be that surprised because I think that's, yeah, he's got that type of ability. Um, yep. But yeah, I, overall, I like, totally. what are your general thoughts? Like, this, this kind of shows me, like, uh, With, I mean, I think man, I think I think we knew Mizzou was going to be down this year, and I don't want to say they're punting. That's not what they're doing, but um, they kept Z- Zach Elam is redshirting, Jaden Ironman is redshirting. Um, they lost a couple, you know, good seniors last year, so I we knew that they were going to have a few spots where they, they weren't quite as strong. Um, but even in this duel, you know, the Jared JQ's uh, Laprade, I believe is his name is. That match was was really competitive the whole way. It was you know there were a couple close takedowns on both sides in overtime. That goes the other way, and then the Wisman Hunter Bowen match was really competitive. It you know, ended up ten nine. Um, so if that goes the other way. I mean, you're looking at a whole different duel. Um, and then obviously, like I said, the four. The, so Virginia Tech got twelve points in the last two matches with the forfeit, and then uh, one forty one they they pin Mizzou's backup. So um, you know, although the score is like, oh man, that's ugly for Mizzou. I think kind of you break it down, eh? It's uh, it, it could be quite a bit better than that. Well, I mean, just those last two matches, they, that's a huge team point swing. You know, yeah, just yeah. I mean, when we when you're talking about two of the best teams in the country, and you introduce a forfeit. You know that you're that's potentially anywhere from you know a nine nine to a twelve point swing in the dual meet. Yeah, um, yeah. So that right there yeah. could be the linchpin between you know the outcome of, of the duel. So I don't think you know seeing and you can speak to this better. You know the success that Brian Smith yeah. has had. Like I'm not. I'm sure he's not ringing the alarms right now. The first week in November, knowing like okay, we had a guy no, out, that, we had a guy pinned. Definitely you know, not. We're still. We got a couple guys that aren't in the lineup this year. Like he's he's playing the long game. He kind of understands where they yeah. where they need to be, and I'm sure he's not, you know, knee jerking at all. I'm sure there's, in some ways, in some ways, if I'm Brian Smith, some ways, losses like this are maybe what you're actually you don't want. Oh, but you kind of shoot their butt. But you kind of hope for, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. 
Absolutely. Um, hey, so I and I don't know why, but I wish I wish we had more inside information, Matt. Um, so Virginia Tech essentially hosts the Southeast Open, which which is the following day. Um, but yet they didn't wrestle a lot of guys in the tournament. I don't know. Do you, you got any insight on that? No, I've seen it. I mean, they, so they they. they because Mizzou, Mizzou went and wrestled Virginia Tech, and the next day turns around and wrestles in the Southeast Open. Virginia Tech wrestled, and essentially it, the Southeast Open is kind of a home meet for them, um, and and they didn't wrestle. I think the approach. So probably I have no with idea what Roby the deal is there. Be like, hey, we're, they're probably getting more ready for the Missouri duel than maybe Missouri sure. was getting ready for Virginia Tech. Well, Missouri had some crazy travel situation too. They got uh, their bags didn't come through. Holy cow. Um, they got delayed and then they had to I think they had to drive or drive from somewhere and their bags didn't come through. So I know they, they would deal with that. Not an excuse, uh, obviously, because I know those type of things happens all the time. But yeah, I, I was just, um, obviously Mizzou was there, so they were going to wrestle in it, but I was kind of surprised that Virginia Tech did not do the same. N- none of their starters from Saturday wrestled on Sunday. Yeah, I can, I can see, you know, on both sides where, you know, with Missouri, they they flew halfway across the country to get to Virginia. Like, hey, let's get our bang for our buck. Let's get a, a quality dual meet. And I don't know, did all Missouri, did did all their starters wrestle the entire tournament or did they wrestle a couple matches and then they pulled them out of the tournament? I didn't really no, know. They, they wrestled through uh, everything. Well, well, let, let me confirm. I, I want to say that they wrestled the entire tournament. Um let me let me just make sure I'm not I'm not lying. Don't want to lie to you here, Matt. So as you're looking this up, um, I'll, sorry, I'll say saying. on the flip side with Virginia. Okay, Tech. I got it. Let's okay. see. Yeah, and even like Mizzou wrestled. Alan Hart wrestled on Sunday. Who they they forfeited that weight on Saturday, and he wrestled Sunday, and he had a really competitive match. He beat Jamie uh, Jamie Hernandez in the semis. He had a really competitive match with Noah Gonzer in the finals and, and lost him. And Gonzer's ranked. He's a top ten guy. But yes, yeah, so all of their guys. Um, uh, uh, yeah, because Mala wrestled, Jake Hughes wrestled. Yeah, all of the guys wrestled on um, on Sunday. Yeah, so maybe on the flip side with Virginia Tech, and I've seen other schools that are running uh, tournaments, open tournaments, following a dual meet. They've they've followed similar trends. Like, okay, the decision is like we're just going to wrestle. They probably knew going in, like, all right, you're just wrestling in the dual meet. You know the way we've laid this out. Yes, and you know I'm sure. You know, Virginia Tech, this is a fundraiser for their program. It's not necessarily, yep. you know, you can kill two birds with one stone by running a tournament, sure. making making money for the program, but also getting quality matches, you know, without the expense of having yeah. to travel. Um, but I'm sure what, what Tony was probably thinking is like, okay, we're wrestling a very high level team. You know, we're going to put a lot of effort into this duel and just focus on the duel meet and then, you know, we're, we're not going to, we don't really want you wrestling six matches on the opening weekend, a dual meet, and then five matches, four yes. or five matches at the open. He's probably yeah. thinking. And, and, du- and double, a double weigh-in, obviously, right. too. So all those factors, I'm sure, yeah. played into the, the decision-making process there for Tony. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that, that's a look at Virginia Tech and, and Missouri. Um where should, I don't know where Missouri is next. I'm not sure. Um, anyways, let's move on to the Princeton Open, Matt. I want to. Uh, I, I don't know if I want to give you some credit here because it's not. You're not totally right, but you got. You know, you got some points. Um, <laughs> we were talking about Cornell and said so the 2019, 2020 is not the year. It's one more year because now they're, they're redshirting Arusha, Yanni, uh, Max Dean. I'm not forgetting anyone, am I? No, those three. Those, so they're Richard, so they're kind of punting this year. But one of the things you said um, was, you know, they, they always find some way to sneak a guy in here. I don't remember what, how, what the wording was, but you said, you know, Cornell comes up with a good guy or two. And, you know, when you're looking at their next year's team, which, you know, I don't, I don't want to go that far off since we're just starting this year. But uh, they get those three guys back. And then they have three true freshmen who are, and they're actually wrestling for the Finger Lakes Wrestling Club. Um they had three true freshmen win the Princeton Open. And I, I just thought that was really impressive. And I thought that was of note. Uh, Chris Foca wins 174. Um, Jacob Cardenas wins 197. And then Luis Fernandez wins heavyweight. So I thought that was really impressive for them to have three true freshmen, which I guess they're not even true freshmen. They're, they're gray shirting. Three gray shirts win the Princeton Open. Yeah, I mean, it's – so I've got to – I think what I said 
I thought I thought Cornell could be a title contender this year. Obviously, with the decision they made to Olympic redshirt their their three horses, um, that's probably not going to be mm-hmm. in, the, in the cards this year. But the one thing that that Rob Cole consistently does year after year is like there's always he always places one or two guys on the podium that you didn't see coming, you know, throughout the year. And I know yes. like I jumped on the Ben Hannes train last year, but he was, he was that, <laughs> he was that guy. Right? Wait, did he all, Amer- he did all American, yeah, right? He did. Or he yeah, did. did. He yeah. did. And then he, then he plays like really high at the US he got Open. second at the Open. <laughs> Um, oh my God. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and, but he, he's got, I mean, he does this year after year, the year before that there was, it was Brandon Womack that you didn't see coming, but then you yeah, put him uh-huh. on the podium. And I'm like, okay, with the three horses they have, with with Dean, with Arusha, with, with Yanni, like you know that they've probably got mm-hmm. guaranteed high placers at three weights. And yeah, if he can absolutely if he can slide two more and, and, and they get and they got Ben Darmstadt yeah, back. Yeah, and this they year. got Darmstadt, who should be, you know, yes. a, a very high placer as well. High so points. With those four guys yep. And the history of sliding one or two guys onto the podium that that you didn't see coming throughout the year, if he could do that, yep. I said that's the recipe for them potentially being in in title contention this year. It looks to be the case just for twenty twenty one, not nineteen twenty with with the Olympic red shirts. Yeah. But mm-hmm. case in point, you know, straight out out of the gates from the Finger Lakes Wrestling Club, we got three gray shirts that that win a good open tournament. Princeton is become yeah. this is a good open tournament with quality individuals. I'm not saying it's the best open tournament in the, in the world, but you know you win. But for Trey, true fr- true freshman to go win tournaments, Matt. I, I don't care what tournament is. You know, we talk about uh, you know some people exceed our expectations, right? But Matt, let's be real. For any true freshman, I don't care how blue chip they are. For any true freshman to go and win college opens, that's a tough task. That does not happen that often. Yeah, I mean, and that's where I, I'm totally with you. I mean, learning how to win, right? I mean, that that's a that's yes. that's another pattern in college, like just how you learn how to win. Well, I mean, the biggest I, I know I can speak for myself, and I don't know if you want to say this about you know other people, but for me, the biggest challenge, and I, and I learned how, I, I picked this one up pretty fast. But the biggest challenge is, hey, I'm up here in Wisconsin. I got to wrestle maybe one good match in a tournament. Right now, the other all the other ones they stink. I can do whatever I want against them, and so then when you get to college, it's like, oh wait, all of these matches are good. All of these guys are strong. All of these guys are going to try hard. I got to be good every single match, and that was for me. You know, like I'll tell you, Missouri Open my freshman year, I beat the guy who won the NCAA tournament that year, Robbie Waller, but then it was like I fell apart. I think I took fifth or sixth after that. You know, it was like I just. I just couldn't string that many good matches together. So for, for high school guys who want to college, I think that's one of the most important things is putting good match after good match after good match. Yeah, and that's where I, I don't even – like some people discredit like at Michigan State when they, they had the freshman-sophomore division. And people were like, oh, they just won the freshman and sophomore division. I'm like, no. Yeah. He still won a tournament. I, I, I get it. They're, these guys are all in their first two years of college. But for some guys, that's what they need, right? They, they need – Yes. To, they're not ready to beat experienced guys like you to your point. Yeah, you could beat Robbie Waller once, but you could you replicate that three or four times throughout the day? Most young I I, I couldn't right. I couldn't. I got my butt kicked by some guys who were schmucks. And so <laughs> most of those guys Damn it. most of those guys in their first two years, like, hey, if you can consistently beat just decent guys back to back to back, then you can then you can springboard and make that le- next level progression against taking on, you know, rank guys consistently, upperclassmen consistently, match after match after yes. match. So, yeah, it's all a process. Matt, because, I, I mean, you, you just said it right there. But going from high school and your true freshman year in college, even the guys who aren't ranked, right, let, let alone the ranked guys, but even the guys who aren't ranked are really good. I mean, there's, you know, if you get Division One NCAA wrestling, all guys from all teams at, at a weight class, I mean, there's, compared to high school, there's 100 good kids. There's 150 good kids. I mean, there's just, you know, obviously once you read the upper echelon, those kids, the, you know, those 100, 150, they're not on the level anymore, right? But when you're a high school kid and you're going to college, there are a lot of really good wrestlers that, and that putting that match together is really, really challenging. And it's really, it's really adjusting your mentality. Like 
the expectation. Like I always, I always laugh. Like in my coaching career, when you know I, I would have a freshman come up and like, "Hey, coach, this guy, this guy was ranked top twenty in the country last year." I'm like, "Yep." Hmm. Yep. Or the parent would come up after his kid would beat a state champ. Like, hey, so-and-so just beat he, this, this kid. He just beat the state champ from New Jersey. I'm like, yeah. I was like, well, he's got to do that again in 20 minutes because the ne- next guy's a state champ from Ohio or Pennsylvania, or he was ranked top five in the country too. And so I think it's like not only getting physically prepared to beat those guys, but just adjusting your mentality, like mentally, like, okay, every guy's going to be good. Everybody, everybody's going to be good. Everybody's, Everybody. everybody's got accomplishments. Every, everybody has high school rankings, national rankings, what, whatever. Like it's just adjusting your mentality to condition yourself. This is just, hey, reset again and again and again and be, be ready to yeah. wrestle, you know, that high level guy every single time. Yes. So let's let's go with another freshman. We talked about the freshman doing good things. Another freshman, great performance. And this guy was was really good um, early in his high school career, and then he kind of like disappeared. I I think maybe he's a multi sport athlete. I I don't really know the story to tell you the truth. Uh, his name's Theorius Robinson. Ro- Theor- Theorius Robinson. He went. He's from Colorado. Went to Northern Colorado. Um, and he's really really good. He he beat Montori Bridges. He won the Cowboy Open. Um, I got. I got to say, they have to be. They being Northern Colorado have to be super stoked with their freshman class and how things are playing out for them. No, I'm super excited for for Troy Nickerson, the head coach at University of Northern Colorado, and obviously this is probably the the signature win on the weekend. But overall, like he's got to be ecstatic. Well, I think that coming out. Yeah, did they have uh, Aliris win also or no? Yeah, Aliris won at 125. They're going to wrestle him right away. As well, I know there's some question marks about what they're going to do with him based on his performance. It's looking like Aliris is going to be the guy right away for for Northern Colorado. Um, they had um, one of their guys, Sa- yeah. Sandoval, beat Tag, and I know Tag is young, but Tag's also a yeah. Julian Tag, well, no, no, he is, but he took a weird loss at he got at. Uh, the preseason nationals. I, I saw it. I almost thought uh, he lost ten nothing to someone. I thought uh, they got to have the wrong person here. Like, sure, surely they got they got you know they, it's just backwards. But it wasn't. He he got whooped. Um, so yeah, he uh, he uh, he had a tough go there. So yeah, but yeah, I mean he he is a former world medalist. So I, I guess we'll say we'll say it's a good win. Yeah. So I, I think across the board, like, and again, like we were we were talking uh, on Monday's podcast, like tempering expectations but as a young team when you have a, an extremely young team like northern colorado this is exactly the start you want them to get establish that momentum yep. get your young guys a taste of success and you know having you know robeson de- defeat bridges who was an all-american having alira's win a title having their 25 pounder beat a top 15 guy their their 84 pounder beat a top 15 guy and so all of a sudden You've got you've got some momentum right out of the gates. You've got these young guys tasting tasting success, not only tasting it, but understanding what how success has to be earned at this level. And you know that those are all those things that I mean, I'm sure that Troy's been talking to his team about you know this summer throughout the preseason, and then for them to capitalize on all all the messages that you've been sending them. All of a sudden. That's where you can, you know, move the move the the needle a little quicker than you might have thought you could do with a young group of athletes. So, was really fired up for Troy to see the performance he's had with this young group. Um, excited where they're heading. I think he's doing a lot of great things. He's had obviously some really good recruiting classes out there the last couple of years, and you know, it's all those things. Is they're like finally putting those pieces to the puzzle, like getting getting the high yes. level talent that to stay in state and actually have that talent starting to produce on the mat is a really, really exciting thing. And so I'm really happy for Troy and everything he's doing out there. Boom. Um, all right. Last, last topic. Um, now I'm heading, I'm heading to medicine, he- heading to Madison today. Uh, Rutgers pulls their true freshman, Sammy Alvarez. It's funny, Matt, because we're kind of talking out of both sides of our mouth here because we're on the one hand, we're talking about how difficult it is 
for freshmen to go have success right away. And then on the other end, we're going to talk about Joe Juragon and Sammy Alvarez and the Northern Colorado guys and how more frequently than ever before, true freshmen are being pulled out and they're actually ready. So it's funny to me because we're kind of talking on both sides of the mouth. We're saying on the one hand, how hard it is. On the other hand, how much more ready freshmen are than they ever have been before. So Rutgers pulls Jojo Aragona and Sammy Alvarez out of uh, out of red shirt. And, um, you know, I, th- I think those guys are both really high level high school guys and they could definitely have impacts this year. Yeah, without a doubt. And I, and I think, and, and again, it, in some ways, it seems like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. But again, every every individual is different, and so you, the way you evaluate it's, new, it, it's nuanced, yeah, right? You got to evaluate it's nuanced. Like the maturity level. You know, some of these guys. It's, I, I know people joke about it now, but a lot of these kids actually redshirted in high school, right? <laughs> a lot of these girls, oh, a lot of these guys, took yeah. their redshirt year in eighth grade, so they've already had that year of extra development earlier on in their career. So. Even though they're a true freshman by grade, by age, they're actually a mm-hmm. redshirt freshman. So that that's a factor that they that they take into consideration. And, you know, where the needs are on the team. Like, hey, the bottom line, like these two Rutgers guy, guys, I'm sure they're on a significant amount of money. I don't know how much, but yeah. there's also a well, financial I, I think it's equation funny. That, that factors in the yeah. decision-making process too. Sure. I think it's funny here that – uh, I mean, the the one rumor that I keep hearing incessantly, Matt, is that there's a huge possibility that um, there's a huge possibility that Nick Seriano is going to come back out of red shirt. Well, it's like, well, if, he, if that's true, if that's possible, if that's a real rumor, why did they pull Sammy Alvarez? Because he could have been red shirt and they could have wrestled someone else as their backup. So now you're telling me you're going to waste uh, you're going to waste his red shirt. Like, come on, that that seems. Uh, now I don't know. Maybe they do pull him out, but that seems far fetched to me. I wouldn't think at this point if you're if you're pulling that guy. For me, that says they're you know, Suriano's sitting for the whole year. He's staying in Olympic red shirt. That's what that's yeah, telling I me. I agree totally. Because that just yep. it just doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? Why would you again, especially against the teams that they were wrestling? They weren't going to be challenged yeah, by any and, of these three teams. So it wasn't even necessary yes. to make the decision to pull him out of red shirt now unless you were completely certain he's going to be the guy the rest of the year. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of how I see it. So, that, and, and there there's also been rumors, which I don't believe this part of the rumor at all, that Suriano is going to go down and wrestle 125. Like, I, I don't – that one is – that one's far-fetched to me. I, I don't see it. I see, man – no, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm crazy. No, I I, I think if he's going that, is he, if he's going to be his most effective at 55 kilos, if he's really going to make a run, he doesn't want to be 57. I mean 57. He doesn't want to be sucking down to scrap 125 all year. That's giving up his size yeah. and strength advantage, which is one of the things he's going to have to need if he's going to compete, you know, against fix and freestyle. He's going to at least have to at least match fixes size power and power yes and if he's sucking down to 25 yep. that's gradually going to erode one of his advantages throughout the year yeah i i agree um okay matt i know i gotta take off to go to madison i i don't think i mean, I, I think we hit everything that we hit everything that was on our list um it was a good opening weekend we got to see some freshmen for the very first time some of them really impressed us some of them uh struggled and then, you know, moving forward, we got a lot of wrestling this weekend. Uh, I know the Badgers wrestle on Friday and Saturday. Uh, Penn State makes their debut this weekend, so it'll be fun watching them. Uh, is there anything else I'm forgetting about that's exciting this weekend? Because I know there's a lot of open tournaments There's kind as well. of a high-level match, North Carolina-Michigan. Um, it's probably, Ooh, that, that's a good one. It's a good one, not as good now with all the Michigan guys taking, taking red shirts. The journeyman duels. Are are this weekend? Oh yeah, well. they're they're all good. Villains. I haven't really dug in to see what the matchups are going to be there, but there's always a handful of really high level matchups that we can probably anticipate. Um, how about uh, Matt? How about the Bearcat Open? That's uh, well, your old stomping grounds. Old stomping grounds always has been one of the top open tournaments. Um, yeah, it's a good one throughout the we uh, throughout the the beginning of the time of year. I know it's kind of. Journeyman duels they they shifted to the same weekend as the as the Bearcat Open, which has kind of affected yes. the quality of the Binghamton Open um, sure. because yep. it's kind of splitting power 
you know, in, in the state of New York and some of the teams coming in. So, but yeah, that's always a quality tournament. I think West Virginia also has their open tournament. Um, It'll be interesting to see what Tim Flynn does with this because it used to be the West Virginia Open. Uh, Harold Nichols, Harold Nichols Harold is this Nichols. weekend also. Yeah, so a ton, a ton of wrestling, right? A ton, a ton <laughs> of wrestling. So yeah, so we're, we're going to have a lot to sift through, come back. Uh, when we come back next week, we're going to have a whole bunch to sift through. Um, so Matt, until then, I will uh, talk to you later. All right, safe trip. See ya.